Good morning, everyone, on this lovely Friday. Anything compared to the uh, rain here yesterday would be lovely, but uh, glad you could make it uh, to this webinar, which will be given by Luis de Orbe, our Prevention and Treatment Administrator. And this is on exploring the link between gambling and homelessness. If you have questions during the webinar, uh, simply put them in the chat box if you can, and I will try to relay any of those questions to Luis that uh, he was unable to see during the, uh, during the talk. But Luis, uh, without further ado, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Phil. Uh, good morning, everyone. It, it, you know what, it is a beautiful morning. Yesterday, uh, it, rained, it rained all night. So this morning, <laughs> I woke up to <laughs> a little flood in the basement. <laughs> All right, but I am very, so very happy to be here with you today. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are, well, I guess this is the first webinar uh, since the end of Prom Gambling Awareness Month. However, you know, with our work at the council, uh, we continue doing this, uh, this work uh, all year round. So Prom Gam Problem Gambling Awareness Month for us is year round. Well, thank you very much. Like Phil said, my name is Luis Del Olbre. And today we're going to have a, we're going to explore the link between gambling and homelessness. And one of the things that we got we are, regarding the homeless is that the homeless population is not a marketable uh, commodity. It's not a marketable population. And we're going to discuss that a little further. And we're going to discuss how very much this population is affected uh, by gambling. So as always, uh, just know that I would like, you know, as always, one thing I do is uh, this is a discussion. Uh, this is not a thing where I'm giving you information. Uh, I'm just saying that we, I, I very much, very much welcome all your comments and questions. Phil is so kind to be able to moderate this for me. And so Phil will be monitoring the chat. Phil, at any time, if you feel uh, that I need to clarify something, somebody asked you uh, asked a question, uh, which need clarification, we would like to do it right there on the spot. And, and, and it's fine. So just, uh, just let me know. This way, uh, I can stop. I have no problem stopping, so we can get it engaged into a discussion as we go along. Like I said, this is a discussion, not simply a talk or a chat from my end. Good, Phil? All good. Thank you. So 800 Gambler, uh, you know, this is something that we have to do, we have to introduce ourselves, right? Uh, 800 Gambler, you must know that although we are speaking up regarding the myths and everything that surrounds gambling, we're not for, nor are we against gambling. Uh, like most people, we do believe that gambling is a form of entertainment. And this is something that we would like to, this is a message that we would like to you know, get forward to the population. You know, this is a form of entertainment, uh, not a, a source for income, uh, not, not something to, to be taken where it's gonna disrupt your life and just be stressful about it. You know, when you go to the movies, Okay, uh, and, and you pay for the movie. At the end of the movie, if you don't like it, you do not go asking for your money back. Okay, this is what gambling is, just a form of entertainment. Okay. So we have to acknowledge this. So the council, we provide a lot of information to the general population. We serve as a statewide advocate uh, to protect the rights of gamblers. And, but yet, you know, like I said, we stay neutral. Uh, when, when, when it comes to gambling, we understand uh, the gambling is a form of entertainment. So we want to keep it there. Uh, we train individual providers. We provide training uh, where providers are able to have the information in order to provide the treatment that gambling, the gamblers would need, anyone in treatment uh, would need. So at the council, you know, we take this matter very seriously. Uh, we want serious providers to come in and get the training and then be part of our network in order to provide the treatment 
that the problem gambler and their family need. Uh, so we ask all those uh, who are in attendance, and or if you know someone who is not in attendance, but you believe they would like to uh, join our network, please get, get on our website, reach out to one of us, uh, and we will give them the information because we really are looking forward uh, for individuals who are able to help us be able to provide treatment uh, for the gambler. So one of the things that we do, we run a helpline. Uh, we provide information and referral service to, indiv to individuals who call our helpline. This helpline is manned, answered, and information given 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Whenever the gambler need information, we're there for them. We also provide resources for professionals and employers, you know, they, they, nowadays, you know, although we are where we are, uh, it's people, a lot of people still have a hard time seeing gambling as an addiction. And therefore that promotes stigma uh, in, in people being able to go out and, and get the treatment that, that they need. Okay. Uh, so we need to, we need to re bring awareness, uh, not just to general public, but most definitely the professionals in, in, in this field and other people who, who have a way, so some kind of way to put a box when individuals are searching for treatment. Okay. We are a point of resource. We provide information. Listen, uh, either call our helpline, call our number, uh, get on our website, look up information, any information you need, reach out to us. We shall be there. So we are covering actually two topics today, right? We're going to talk about problem gambling, and then we're going to talk about homelessness. Okay. The two, once you see the information that, that I'm about to share with you, the two tend to go hand in hand in, 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 in many ways. And this is why we're here, to bring awareness to that aspect. So what is problem gambling? So problem gambling or gambling addiction. It includes all gambling behavior patterns that compromises, disrupt, and damages personal, personal, family, and vocational pursuits. Uh, a gambling addiction will put a stop, will put a pause, will disrupt your entire life in one way or another, okay, if it goes unchecked. So we want to make sure that this is where uh, we'll, we come to be when, when, it, when it comes to gambling. Okay, what is homelessness? What is it to be homeless? Well, you know, I, it's in, in this research, when I started uh, looking for things, it was funny, but do you know that there's not one, coming from the government side anyway, there is not one single, that, you know, coverall definition for homelessness. The definition differs depending on the department. So now this, this is the situation when it comes to how things are defined. When studies are conducted, studies are specific, conducted to how something is defined. Because homelessness does not have a single definition, the results, statistic, information, data is collected differently. And therefore, at the very end, uh, somehow, some way, you go end up with something that's very, very different and, and very obscure. And I will show you uh, coming down the line. You know, the, the US Department of Housing, uh, uh, HUD, they conduct studies, uh, they conduct statistics when it comes to housing. Well, the homeless are covered under HUD under their definition. But then also the US Department of, of Education dealing with youth. As you know, we have nearly 2 million children who are homeless in the United States, okay? They're defined under the Department of Education. Okay. So statistic uh, is gonna come up differently based on who definition of homelessness you're following, okay? And we, we're going to uh, explore this area a whole lot more. So homelessness in the United States. So, 
the estimated homeless uh, homeless people in the United States between 2019 and 2020, uh, according to a White House press release, it stands at 580,466. Now, HUD uh, says that 17 people for every 10,000 are homeless. Now, the reason why I'm giving you this information is because it's permanent, it's pertinent to what um, we, we're going to continue saying because we are here. The Council of Compulsive Gambling is an advocate for the problem gambler. That means all problem gamblers through all sector of life. Okay, There is a problem gambling issue within our homeless community. Okay? So although from in many areas, the homeless are voiceless, we shall be the voice for, those, for the homeless individuals who are suffering in silence due to gambling addiction. Okay. And the reason we're giving this information is because as you know, like any statistic or anything else, what happens is if we don't have the proper data, if we don't have the proper information, uh, resources will not be channeled where it's most needed. And this is the situation that I have found when it comes to the homeless population here and the way it's defined, okay? So keep, keep aware of this number. The White House put out a certain number. Uh, uh, HUD put out a certain number. According to HUD, uh, if there's 17 people for every uh, 10,000, the numbers are around this formulation comes out to uh, just a little over 600,000, something like 612,000, okay? However, we have a, organization that is very much geared towards the homeless and following what it is that, following the pattern of the, of the homeless. And it's the National Homelessness Law Center. I believe this, this is the same organization that was the National Center uh, for Homelessness and Poverty. Uh, but someone, they, 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 they changed their, uh, they changed the name along the way. They're now the National Homelessness Law Center out of Washington, DC. Now, according to them, and, and they use this definition and to come up with the numbers and, and the estimate they came up with. So the way they, they uh, define homelessness is the number of Americans who sleep in shelters, transitional housing, public places not meant for human habitation and all their cars. As we know, many homeless people live in their vehicles. So this center has estimated that there is at least 2.5 to 3.5 million homeless individuals. Now, remember this? Very big difference. Now, this estimated of the homeless individuals, this does not include the additional 7. Point million who have lost their own home and are now doubled up in, you know, in, in someone else's home due to whatever uh, economic necessity they may have. You know, uh, during the pandemic, there was a thing where it says, you know, due to people not paying rent, uh, people could not be in bed. Stuff like that. But uh, during the pandemic, a lot of people fell in distress, uh, financial distress. So therefore they found it necessary for them to go double up and live in other people's homes. And on top of that, you have, now the, the, this, this, uh, this number, this population here is not covered under the estimated uh, number of individuals uh, who are homeless in the United States, according to the National Homelessness Law Center. There are also over a million people who are working either part-time or full-time that are unable to pay for housing. That is a lot of people out there who are very much in need, and but yet, they, you know, they don't get the, the help they need uh, for whatever reason. So we're gonna discuss this right now, we're gonna concentrate on the gambling aspects of it. So what are the reasons for homelessness? You know, there are many reasons, right? However, all I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna give you uh, the top five. So we know we have a lack of affordable housing, okay? 
this contributes to homelessness. Unemployment contributes to homelessness, poverty, mental illness. Okay, and we know that you know uh, there is a high rate of mental illness among the homeless. And because they are not a marketable commodity, a lot of times we do not find the services. Uh, these individuals do not have the services that, that they require. Okay. Uh, substance abuse and the lack of the needed services there. Okay. So these are the top reasons for homelessness. However, does problem gambling have the potential to cause homelessness? You know, during this research, I came across something that may, maybe a lot of you already knew, but you know, I did. And I found out that there is a study out there. Uh, it's this, it was discouraging to me that you know it wasn't a follow-up besides this, but I do, I do find out that the U.S. Department of Justice, the Office of Justice Programs, uh, they did a study in 1999. And the, and, this, and, and the office that did the study is the National Gambling Impact Study Commission. This commission uh, was enacted in 1996. Uh, it, it was enacted by the Congress in 1996 and President Bill Clinton signed it into law, okay? In 1999, in June 1999, the commission put out the final report on the impact of gambling on the United States. And one of the things they covered was homelessness. So we have had all this information for a very long time. At the end of the, uh, the webinar, what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to try to put up a QR code that I found that you can actually, they turned this into a book. This actually, uh, the US Department of Justice turned this into a book which was released in uh, September. September of 1999. So I'm going to see if I can put up that, that uh, QR code this way you know, for those individuals who might want to look at this full report. Okay. Uh, Phil, I just want to take the chance now, uh, now that we're here. Is there anything that, that, any questions or any comments that we'd like to cover? Yeah, two, two questions came up and one was specific about New Jersey. If you had to estimate the Jersey homelessness numbers uh, what might it be? You show the national statistics. Maybe we could use those same percentages. And then uh, someone made the point about um, younger people couch surfing, so to speak, just going from sleeping in a different place, different home with friends. Are they considered uh, homeless or are they in another category? You know, I I had a friend, well, I someone that I knew. I, I don't think he he much uh, attached himself to people. He called himself a wanderer. Now this individual does this individual does have family, and he has the family li living home because he he has two sisters, who have home, and he has uh, his mother, who's still alive. However, he chose not to live with them. He doesn't consider himself homeless. He is a uh, self uh, label, self titled wanderer. This young man travels the United States. Uh, a lot of times he travels the United States on the trucks. So he goes to truck stops and he hides under the truck, which is, a, you know, I mean, listen, we talk about going down the highway and you hanging onto the, to the bottom of the truck just to get from one place to another. Okay. Uh, the homeless population is hard to get an exact count of them because a lot of the studies, a lot of the census are, are done from shelters. And this is why when you look into the statistics when it comes to homelessness, they go uh, per, per day. How many people go homeless per day? Because they're constantly being fed the numbers in shelters. Uh, but you have a lot of people who are in unsheltered locations. You have a lot of people who are wandering around. They, they're, being, they're not being counted. And that, that situa you know, that's one of the big situations. Plus the, the definition, the, the, big, the big difference in, in definition when it comes to homeless. So 
how, you know, who counts who uh, under what category? This is why such a disparity for us, you know, for, you know, or such a difficulty for us to say, okay, we have this many homeless individuals. We just don't. We just have the data. Uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's impossible to get such exact data. So we basically estimate and do about. Uh, did that explain a little bit, Phil? I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, so let con let, let's continue with the study uh, from the National Gambling, uh, the National Gambling Impact Study Commission, okay? So in this report on the chapter seven, chapter seven covers a whole lot of area, poverty, uh, youth gambling, un you know, underage gambling, all this kind of stuff, but also cover homelessness. And it says individuals with gambling problem seems to constitute a high percentage of the homeless population. And the study goes on to break things down in categories in, in, in different sectors of the United States, including Atlantic City. Okay. It says the Atlantic City Rescue Mission. Uh, those of you from South Jersey, I'm pretty sure you, you know of this, uh, of this organization because they function out there. Uh, to this day, they stay still doing it. The Atlantic City Rescue Mission reported to the commission that 22% of its clients are homeless due to gambling problems. Okay. Atlantic City has a homeless situation. Uh, a few years back, an, in, a family member of this individual that I, that, that I knew from years ago calls me and tells me that her son uh, decided not to come home. So, you know, it was a big search uh, for this individual. It turned out that he decided to go homeless. He decided, he went to Atlantic City. He was, he was a big, uh, he was a regular Atlantic City. Uh, one day he went to Atlantic City, lost everything that he had, and he decided to stay there. Okay. I have not been in touch with this individual for years, so I don't know where he is right now. But I did manage to find him. I spoke with him. Uh, I, I gave his mother his message. This individual was living under the boardwalk in Atlantic City, along with a whole lot of people. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we, have a, uh, we have one of our prevention specialists, uh, Vin. Uh, Vin you know, is fresh from the area. The Atlantic City Rescue Mission is doing great work down there when it comes to the homeless. I know the, uh, the the director and a lot of the staff. You know they go under the boardwalk. They try to get those individuals from under there. Uh, I have I, I found out and I was informed that they actually have a name under the boardwalk. It's called <laughs> it's called Underwood Motel. The people who reside under the boardwalk in Atlantic City uh, sees that and calls it the Underwood Motel. And if you go down there at any time, you're going to find in certain areas, a very large number of homeless individuals living under the boardwalk. So, you know, when you're in Atlantic City and you are walking back and forth on that boardwalk, just keep in mind that there may be people living under that boardwalk. There may be some homeless individuals who are suffering with gambling addiction under that boardwalk and suffering with other issues because as you know, the homeless population, they have a array of issues, health issues and a mental disorder that the population suffers. And a lot, and a lot of them are there under the boardwalk. Just, just like many are throughout the city, throughout cities in, in New Jersey. But since we're concentrating on this, uh, the commission reported that 22% of its clients are homeless due to gambling. Chicago, same study. It says a survey of homeless service providers in Chicago found that 33% consider gambling a contribution and contrib contributing factor in the homelessness of the people in their program. Listen, this is a very high, this is a very high percentage. Jersey, Atlantic City, 22%. Chicago, 33%, okay? In Vegas, 7,000 homeless individuals in Vegas 
reveal that 20% are there due to gambling problems. 20%. This picture I found, uh, this is one of the things that Las Vegas did with the homeless, where they took a parking lot and the parking spaces in the parking lot were turned into you know, personal areas where, the, where they brought the homeless individuals to this parking lot and each one claimed uh, a space. So this was the, the, during the pandemic and this is how a lot of them were, were being sheltered in, in one area. But when it comes to gambling, 20% reported a gambling problem. So overall, uh, throughout the United States, uh, dozens of rescue mission uh, overall reported an average that 18% of their clients has cited gambling as a cause of their homelessness. 18% nationwide. We have these numbers. We know this out there. But like I said, this is not a marketable population. So therefore, their needs go unattended because there are so little resources available to deal with this situation. There are so, so, such little resources and scared to, uh, to, to address the situation. So, you know, we, we have this result is there. You know, there is such a high pre you know, prevalence for gambling. Uh, disorder and it, it shows the necessity to identify and address gambling problem among the homeless. Okay. We're going to discuss, like I said, this is a discussion. I want you to share with me, you know, tell me your ideas. L l l let's get together and, and, and let's talk about how, you know, we uh, deal with the homeless population. How, how can we support the homeless population? How can we try to get them out of the situation and elevate the quality of life? Uh, Phil, another guy, we're taking a break now. Any comments, any questions? Uh, right now you're okay on uh, a couple people posted links to uh, sites that uh, had some additional statistics, but no questions hanging out there at the, at the moment. Thank you very much, Phil. Okay, so we know that this is a this is very much a vulnerable population. This is a voiceless population. Uh, so we need to pick up the torch for our health fellow human human beings. Okay. Uh, we know that the, the level of different areas, drug abuse, mental illness, uh, depression, the loneliness. You know, how often do we walk by homeless people? How often do they sometimes come around and you know, try, try to get our attention, uh, you know, try to get some change from us. And sometimes we just, we, we just nick some off. Okay. A lot of things are being done. Although these numbers show such a high rate of gambling that goes on with, the, uh, with our homeless population, so such little is being used and such little resources are being applied to this population. Okay, there's, very, there's very little research. There's a whole lot of studies. Listen, the homeless population, if you go on the web, there's so many studies out there worldwide. As you know, Australia, Australia has a uh, substantial gambling problem with the population. The, uh, this includes the homeless population. So there's studies out there. Uh, the United Kingdom, they have studies out there. Warsaw, has, there's a lot of studies out there when it comes to gambling. The numbers are there. However, the resources allocated to try to deal with this situation is very thin and it's very scarce. And the whole thing is not consistent. It might be there one year, the funding might be there one year to help them homeless, it is not the next. It, you know, all, all this depends on how the funding is allocated and how it's distributed. But the homeless population suffers from it. Uh, we must not forget how very vulnerable homeless population in other areas. Listen, the homeless population has a very, it, it has a higher rate than the average, the normal population about premature mortality. 
they have a high rate of suicide and unintentional injuries. They're more at risk uh, to have infectious diseases or be, you know, or, or be contact with individuals uh, who are, you know, who do be, come in contact with infectious diseases. They're more likely to suffer from mental disorder. Okay, and there is a prevalence of substance misuse. You know, there is a when I was when I was in Newark when I was working in Newark. Uh, there's a homeless individual there. I'm not I'm not gonna mention her name because the fact is she is very well known in Newark. And if you have if you have ever been in Newark, traveling up Bloomfield Avenue, out from North Broad, uh, you will know this individual. But one thing, you know, every, every time I always run into her, you know, I always I always give a little something. We we talk, we have a conversation. Uh, but she has a short term memory. She, she has very short term memory. She does not remember things uh, in long term. And one day, it just so happened that she asked me for some change. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give her any. I didn't have it. She cursed me out. <laughs> she, she cursed me out. Uh, she saw that I have a tie. So I had a tie on. And she's like, you got a tie? So I know you got money. You know, so we went into the conversation. But I did not know this individual to have any sort of uh, substance uh, abuse issues. One thing I know that she did for sure. Listen, this is way before, this is years before I actually uh, came to work uh, for the council. Uh, every little money that she had, everything that she has went for scratch off and lotteries. Lottery, scratch off are the favorite form of gambling for the homeless. It, it's, you know, it's accessible to them. Uh, it, it doesn't cost much, a few dollars. One time I asked her, I says, you know, can I just buy you something? Uh, she said, I don't need for you to buy me something to eat. People give me food. I just need some money. Because, you know, people will give her food. But she wanted some money so she can go out there and get her scratch-offs. See, for a homeless individual, winning a scratch-off means being able to get a bed for that night. Sometimes you see out there, you see a homeless individual with a sign uh, that all they want is $20. They want to be able to get $20 because with $20, they can go to you know, a, a motel and they will give them a bed for the night. And a lot of times that's what they're begging for. It's, it's not, you know, we, we look at a homeless individual begging for money and the first thing sometimes that comes to mind is, Oh, he or she is going to go and buy drugs or misuse some sort of substance. Sometimes they're just using it to, one, buy some, some more sort of gambling paraphernalia or to be able to go somewhere and sleep. A lot of homeless individuals do not like going to shelters. They do not feel safe in shelters. And many shelters do not provide the security that many need to keep them safe throughout the night. Okay. So a lot of them, uh, they just don't trust it and, and they don't go. Okay. And this very much goes for our homeless veterans. Listen, prolonged homelessness will cause an individual's health to deteriorate. And poor health shall reinforce homelessness. They're kept there. You know, they have poor health because they're homelessness. But the longer they stay homeless, the more likely they will remain that way. We need to do something about this. We need to be able to help these our fellow human beings. It's not the fact that they're just Americans, but they're fellow human beings that need help. They're fellow human beings that 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 require our attention. I know here at the council, because we are advocate for the situation, uh, for, for, for the gambler, that we do advocate for the homeless. Uh, Miss Alice, who I am you know, very glad to see that uh, she came in and locked on. Miss Alice uh, works 
you know, exclusively a lot with the homeless. Uh, and I appreciate it. And, and I just love her effort. I love her heart. And I appreciate the fact that she goes out there and does whatever she can and goes wherever she needs to go uh, to be able to help the population. Something that, you know, just an example. Ms. Alice, thank you. It's just an example that, uh, that many of us need to follow. And I appreciate it. Homelessness and problem gambling are both recognized as social and public health concern. This is recognized. You know, we call gambling the hidden addiction. Okay. This takes a very special meaning when it comes to our homeless population. Because they're hiding in plain sight. We know that they're there. We see them. But sometimes we just turn a blind eye. We need to get better at this. We must get better at this in order to be able to help our fellow humans. So what is needed? Listen, our society is very good at spending time and resources at the back end of any situation. This is why, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's out of the issue here, but this is why we are where we are when it comes to our incarcerated population. And this is why, you know, we have such mass incarceration because we have no problem spending billions, trillions on the back end instead of investing on the front end, helping families before they fall into crisis, helping individuals before they fall into crisis. Sometimes things at the back end, are just, they're just much easier to find. We can see the issue, we can see the problem. They're there, so therefore, you know what? Let me handle it this way. We need to be, we need to do more on the back and on the front end. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what will be if we would place individuals like teachers, okay, police officers, people that are helping us on an everyday basis? If we hold them at such a level, uh, uh, such a steam level as celebrities, you know. Uh, <laughs> Let's make them stars. Let's make them movie stars. Uh, let's make these individuals that can support us, that can make our life a uh, whole lot better. Give them the, the proper support in the proper situation. Uh, I believe the teachers are, 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 are not supported as well as, as they can be. Okay, especially in the inner cities. We need that. We need to get better at investing resources and time on the front end, okay? Listen, treatment, giving people treatment where they are must be provided. Okay. Treatment is essential to help those who are in the situation right now. Okay. We must provide treatment with love and compassion with those, you know, for those who are afflicted. But let's not forget those who fall into despair around us daily, because we see it daily. This is why when, when prevention, we spend so much time uh, empowering parents, giving individuals the information to empower them to make educated decisions about what is in their best interest. Spend time, we need to invest time at the front end to put more into prevention. If not just as much as we do in treatment. And, you know, we have so many people who are in recovery. Uh, with, you know, gambling is so advertised in such ways. Uh, gambling is, is, is advertised as something 
fabulous and grand glamorous is advertised as a form of you to get out of the situation that you're in. It's advertised as a way for you to better your life. What do you think that is doing? You know, and with, with us, we have individuals who are in recovery from gambling and we're gonna support them and make sure that they stay active within their recovery. But we cannot forget that all this advertisement and all this uh, targeted advertisement towards our youth, we can't let that go unnoticed because it is our youth that are gonna follow in those footsteps. And these are the ones who, are, who, who, who will or shall be, you know, take the spots of those individuals who come out of the gambling addiction. So we, got, we have to get better at being able to spend resources in the front end. Luis, there are a couple questions if you want to try them now. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, one was you touched on Atlantic City and Las Vegas as being, unfortunately, kind of hotbeds for homelessness. Do you think that's because those people are looking for that one opportunity to go to a casino and change their lives? Or are there other reasons we're not thinking of? No, well, the, 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 that's one of them. Uh, you know, the reason why you have a lot of homeless also gravitating to these places is because they see these places as opportunities. Okay, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of individuals coming into to these, uh, to these locations, you know, in search of money. A lot of them go there. You know, in Atlantic City, you know, there, there was a, a lot of uh, situations where surrounding communities were busing. And I, I believe that they call this bus therapy. They were busing the homeless to Atlantic City. Okay. And a lot of the homeless was in Atlantic City because a lot of, you know, the rescue, the, uh, the, the rescue mission that's there, they were providing food. Uh, they, they, they were giving, uh, giving individuals, you know, somewhere warm, uh, somewhere dry uh, to stay. Okay. And in th those places such as Atlantic City, Las Vegas, and, and, and places now where you're going to see a lot of gambling, uh, because all these gambling casinos are going up everywhere now, uh, you're going to see a, a, a very pocket of big uh, homeless population around there. Many of them are looking uh, to make th that win. They're looking to be able to go into the casino. And you know, a lot of times the homeless people, <laughs> they're not really looking for, for a big thing. Uh, I, I know uh, the individuals who's homeless in, uh, in Newark, you know, she won every once in a while, $50, $75 in, in, in the scratch off, uh, but that's just for the day. So yes, they're looking for that because they want the opportunity, but it's not to make a ritual or to do things. Sometimes they just want enough to get through that day. And they see these locations as a good opportunity or a good place for them to go and manage to survive one more day. Anything else? Uh, yes, there was a, um, a question about are those people that are incarcerated, are they considered homeless or are they in a different category? They're in a different category. Incarcerated individuals are a ward of the state, okay? So the state is to provide all the resources necessary for incarcerated individuals. Now, it depends, like I said, you know, some coming out of, the, uh, of prison do become homeless. The minute their commitment is up, the minute their sentence is up and they're out, uh, the state no longer has a hold of them, uh, they're out on their own, okay? Uh, many of the people in, in the incarcerated population uh, that are out here, the returning citizens, don't have places to go. Uh, the parole board uh, sometimes helps certain individuals, uh, a small amount of the population that is recently released to gain housing, to find employment, things like that. There, there is, uh, 
there's an organization such as the New Jersey Reentry Corporation uh, that is asking the that's asking uh, the community to refer those individuals that are coming out of prison to go to go to one of the centers. They have multiple locations uh, throughout the United States. So those those uh, organization, that organization, the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, uh, they are working towards helping the incarcerated population coming out. Because remember, one of the things that people do in prison is they gamble a lot. Uh, we covered that in, in a previous webinar. There's a lot of gambling that goes on in prison. But while they're incarcerated, no, they're not considered homeless. Anything else, Phil? Um, would sports betting and internet gambling uh, being more prevalent in uh, New Jersey, are we seeing more homeless because of uh, that being legalized? Well, listen, the advancement of technology when it comes to uh, gambling is going to put us in a situation where more people are going to be subjected to hardship. Uh, you have a lot of people losing a lot of money on a daily basis. Uh, you have new individuals you know, going to the problem gambling area on a, on a daily. So yes, uh, I can see this problem uh, getting much worse. I can see, well, listen, just the, uh, the numbers that, that we presented here, okay? The numbers are there, okay? We're talking about 22% of the homeless population in Atlantic City contribute their homelessness to gambling. This trend will continue. Uh, and these high numbers are not going to come down or get any lower if we don't do something about it. All right, Phil, uh, let, me fit, let me wrap up the, uh, the next few so we can open it up to a general discussion. But you know, what's needed? And listen, this is my personal input based on what uh, I found out here and what I did. So what is needed, okay? Listen, let us develop strategies to identify root causes, okay? And we have to demand that a public representative produce preventive policies that are heavy-ended on effectiveness. We don't have, uh, we have policies everywhere, right? Our, our society is governed by different policies, not of policies or effective. We, we need to be able to have effective policy. We need to have a public, we need to put a demand on, on a public, representative to, to help us out with this situation. But it starts with us, okay? We have to develop strategies. Let's not give it up to someone else to do it. We know what the situation is, let's do something about it, okay? Let's create programs that meet the need and improve quality of life. There's so many programs out there. Example, food pantry. I was part of a food pantry that used to bag up food before the clients, before the, the uh, participants got there. It's efficient, but it's not effective. They bag up the food, the food are in plastic bags. And plastic bag, remember, after May 4th, no more plastic bags. So <laughs> bring you reusable bags, okay? So no more plastic bags in, in, in some areas. So listen, they are the, the 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 person will come in. They will have an they will have like a two hour gap where people will come in to pick up food, right? So since they're only two hours, people will rush in get their food. What they will do it is they will grab the food and they will give it to individuals, and the individuals will keep going. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this. I say, you know what? What is wrong with this picture? We're not talking to people. We're not getting people's stories. We're giving someone a bag full of food without knowing their need. What if I'm giving this lady or this gentleman who is coming in to get food for their children peanut butter when their children may be allergic to peanut? How does that help that individual? Talk to people. You know, sometimes being efficient is not truly effective. 
Let's take the time to talk to people. Let's meet, let, let's create programs that meet their need and improve the quality of life. You know, that is investing on the front end. Let's help out. Let's create healthy environments through collaboration. Stop fighting for scraps. Get together. You know, it, it, when you go to a buffet, right? When you go to a buffet, you get a plate. And there's so much food. And if you go down the buffet table or even at a party where they're serving food, you grab a little bit of food. If by the end, by the end of, that, of that food line, if you grab a spoonful of, of each thing that's available, you're going to have such a large plate of food. Okay, sometimes little chunks work. Let's collaborate. If someone is already doing something well, listen, if you, the council, we've been here for 39 years. We in 39 years may know a little something about problem gambling. After 39 years and touching hundreds of thousands of individuals, give us a call, okay? We may, after 39 years, develop the experience that can actually help people. So give us a call, that's what we're here for, okay? So let's create healthy environments by, by collaborating. There's no need for, for me to re reinvent the wheel when, you know, it's already done. So let's get together, let's get our resources together and be able for us to be able to collaborate. You know, anytime, just give us a call. We're here to help. Give us a call. We will respond. Okay. And right now, I want to thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you being here with me this morning. I appreciate you being here with us this morning. I hope the information that we shared with you this morning is, is helpful. In a, in a way that be able to pass this information along as well. I appreciate it. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to escape out of here, right? I'm gonna close this off and I'm gonna see, let me see. I'm gonna see if I can share, if I can share this QR code with you. You can uh, scan uh, this QR code and it'll give you the, uh, the study uh, that was done by the National Gambling, the National Impact Study Commission. If you scan this code or just go on Google Books uh, and you, you, you'll find it, okay? It's, uh, it's the National Gambling Impact Study Commission, okay? And it's the final report, June, 1999. For those of you who want to see the entire report, uh, we just covered chapter seven and just the homeless part, homelessness part of chapter seven. Okay. So let me put that back up and leave it there. So, Phil, uh, if there are any other questions, uh, any comments? There was a question about how overall uh, this affects school age children and ending up. Uh, on the displaced from homes or uh, homeless themselves? Listen, the United States, uh, you know, this statistic goes out everywhere uh, when it comes to homeless and to homeless children. The United States, we have, we have nearly 2 million homeless children. Uh, I, know, I know personally, I know myself, individuals who are living in cars, families who are living in their car with their children. They're afraid to, to say anything because their children will be taken away. You know, you, you can't be homeless uh, and, and bring your children with you. You know, the, during the, uh, a few years ago, I don't know if it was like three or four years ago, the lottery went up so really high. But about four, no, four or five years ago, the lottery went up really high. It was like 1.4 or $1.5 billion. 
Uh, I was working, we, you know, I knew of this family who the mother had a dream that she won this lottery. And she, bet, you know, she, she gave, she went all in with this dream. She started buying lottery tickets at, at all costs every week after week, day after day. She was just buying buy lottery tickets. Where it came to a point where she couldn't pay her rent. And she became, and she became uh, homeless and her children were taken away from her. So this, this, this is a, uh, a situation that's there. So we do have a lot of homeless children and they are fixed. Listen, if we do not help the individuals, families that are falling into this, the children is gonna go right into that. And then what's gonna happen is we are, we are very happy to step in and separate that family, okay? Investing in the front end is being able to keep that family together. Let's develop resources. Let's have resources available where these families can go into and get the help they need before they fall into crisis. And that is how we help the children. We help the children by providing resources to the family so the family can stay intact. Anything else, Phil? No, you, oh, you hit it all. I'll... And uh, I think you set a record for most tabs open on your computer. So uh, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> it, it's looking good, but uh, um, I, so let me I got stop a sharing lot here. out of that. No, I'm, I'm sure uh, everyone else did too. So uh, thank, thank you so much for that. And uh, you, you know the schedule better than me, I think. Uh, who, who's got the next uh, webinar and uh, when, when should these uh, folks sign up? I should have had that on the screen, I'm sorry. Actually, you know, uh, we, 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 will, we will announce it. Once uh, you know, we have people coming in, we will announce it. Uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna set a schedule. And we're going to continue with the webinars. But Phil, what we're going to do is we're going to do it quarterly for now. So stay tuned. You, you'll continue to receive our, you're going to continue to receive our. Uh, blast. Our our blast. Yeah. Listen. Uh, <laughs> no, it was coming. <laughs> you continue to, to receive our blast and we will uh, let, let you know when our next webinar and, and then topic is going to be. So I wanna thank you very much for joining us. And if anyone has any comments, any questions, please feel free to reach, us, to reach out to us. Uh, if you require any resource, uh, reach out to us, okay? Anything else, Phil? Luis, great, great job. Show them the muscle, man. Oh, you know what? <laughs> you have been provided the information. <laughs> You're now <laughs> You're to make an educated decision in what's in your best interest. It's my little muscle man. You're empowered. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Have a great weekend, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. I appreciate it. Mr. Leonard. Blazer, always great to uh, to see you here. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.